Hello, my name is Dr. Brian Reid, and I am a naturopathic doctor. And this is a video that's um, in response to a question that somebody asked, uh, um, commented on one of my posts. And uh, basically, the uh, gist of the question was, uh, you know, I'm out of a uh, moldy environment, um, and yet I still have these lingering symptoms. Um, and so um, and I've, I've heard that story uh, a number of times over the course of time, and sometimes it's, you know, I'm out of the moldy environment, yet I still have this persisting issue with fatigue or neurological symptoms or chemical sensitivities or electrical hypersensitivity uh, syndrome or wh whatever it happens to be. Um, and so um, the the sort of nature of that, and I mean, like the specific answer to that person would be, um, you know, talk to a clinician who's familiar with all of these things and get properly worked up and diagnosed and treated and all of that, of course. Um, but just some kind of thoughts to think about um, in, um, uh, you know, if, if that's if that's something that's applying to a, a given case um, would be um, a couple of things. So one would be, um, let's say, you know, hypothetically that um, there's no colonization of mold in the person's sinuses, so they're not walking around still being exposed to a steady store, to a steady source of mycotoxins, um, then in that case, it might be that the effects from the mycotoxins from the mold have left their system um, in a state of disrepair. Um, they might have some um, ongoing issues with um, bile production and, and flow and function. And so there might be an issue with being able to metabolize fat soluble toxins because to make bile, um, it requires several ingredients. Um, and it also requires um, adequate methylation ability. Uh, the methylation cycle is responsible for making so many different products um, in the body, um, metabolizing certain things in the body. But one of the things that it spends, uh, that our body spend a lot of our methylation resources um, producing is something called phosphatidylcholine, which makes up a significant portion of our bile. So for example, mycotoxin exposure could interfere with methylation uh, function, therefore interfering with bile production, and then leaving the patient's body not you know, just because you get out of mold doesn't mean everything immediately heals and bounces back. Um, and so they might have more difficulty detoxifying things that are fat soluble, uh, potentially through a mechanism like that. So they might be left with, say, chemical sensitivities. Um, <clears throat> another possibility is that as I've posted in other videos before, um, mold mycotoxins are uh, very detrimental to our mitochondria, our little energy producing units in our cells. And so if a person said, I'm out of the moldy environment, but I'm still feeling really tired and depleted, brain foggy, that type of thing, it might be that their um, mitochondria are just have not been able to bounce back yet. And it can be challenging for them to bounce back um, if they don't have adequate um, uh, sort of nutrient support essentially. And sometimes we just can't harvest enough nutrients from our food to get our mitochondria back on track as quickly as we might um, want them to get back on track. So that could be another possible mechan or, um, a mechanism behind that. Um, another possibility is <clears throat> that it might be that there are other factors of, at play that were allowed to proliferate um, or become more of an issue because of the mold. Um, so mycotoxins, some of them in particular, are very immunosuppressive, in particular mycophenolic acid, which I was blown away when I learned that mycophenolate um, is an immunosuppressive drug that exists um, on the market. It, it can be used, um, it's used as an immunosuppressant um, in certain cases, um, and that's made by certain mold species. Um, so uh, that and other mycotoxins can be immunosuppressive. So there's a link between um, mold exposure and, and subsequently mycotoxins and sometimes seeing more um, issues with chronic or reactive or rather reactivated uh, or, or maybe chronic um, viral issues persisting. So if the immune system was suppressed by the mold, the viruses come to the party, they contribute to some of these symptoms, you get out of the mold, well, maybe there's a bit of a cell danger response issue happening and the virus is persisting and the system's just in lockdown mode and the person's you know continuing to feel unwell so it might be that something like a, a virus needs to be addressed um, in that type of case um, mold mycotoxins can also be very uh, in some cases uh, deleterious or damaging to the gut and so maybe something like SIBO or yeast overgrowth maybe parasites something like that could be um, a, a residual issue and so if that's happening then that could be potentially driving symptoms so I'd be more suspicious of that if that person in question said, you know, I have these gut issues that are like digestive issues that are 
you know, started after I was in the moldy environment, or maybe uh, were I had pre-existing issues with, you know, say IBS, and then my symptoms got worse when I was in the moldy environment, and now I'm out of the moldy environment, and I'm still feeling unwell, and my gut issues are still quite notable. That would kind of feed into that possible explanation. Um, so th those are a few possibilities. Um, then the other scenario uh, would be if maybe there was some mold colonization while the patient, uh, while the person was living in um, that moldy environment, um, they might be, as I as I think of it, and I say it to my patients all the time, um, you know, you might be a walking mold incubator, um, and it's kind of a it's a gross thing to think about, but um, as I also am fond of saying to my patients, um, you know, mold ultimately wants a few different things. It wants a place that's, you know, at a, at a pretty decent temperature, so like not too hot, not too cold. So sinuses are a pretty good uh, fit, fit that bill. Um, the mold wants humidity, which our sinuses are fairly humid. Um, and then it also wants a food source. And there's plenty of delicious, to mold at least, um, stuff up in the schnoz, you know, snot and debris and all these lovely things that are up there. Um, so the mold, um, to my understanding, is very happy to live in the sinus. And if the immune system is compromised enough by mycotoxins or other things, then the mold could potentially colonize. And when it gets enough of a foothold, it could potentially be releasing enough mycotoxins to keep that immunosuppression going. And so the mold just, you know, happily lives on in the sinuses, even after you're out of that moldy environment. And that's something that we see in our practice when we do mold, uh, our nasal swabs and cultures, we've sometimes seen like just crazy amounts of black mold or other types of mold growing on Petri dishes. And then of course, doing a mycotoxin, uh, urine mycotoxin test, um, even after a patient's sometimes been out of a known moldy environment for quite a while, their current um, you know, work or living um, environment is, you know, we're, we're quite confident it's mold free, um, then we can still see sometimes these massive levels of mycotoxins coming up in their urine, suggesting what's well, probably coming from somewhere uh, in, internal in that case, and presumably some nasal colonization. There, there is some limited evidence um, in the literature suggesting that um, mold might be able to colonize the intestinal tract, possibly other parts of the body. It's very much an understudied area. Um, but um, if there is ongoing, if, if there is mold colonization, then that could certainly be um, perpetuating all those mold symptoms. Like I'm out of the moldy environment. I still have all these symptoms. Like, well, maybe you've still got mold kind of where it counts um, in the schnoz. So those are a few uh, thoughts to consider, um, trying to figure out why after getting out of a moldy environment, there might still be some persisting symptoms.